In the summer of 2003, I began filming the series Atheism, A Rough History of Disbelief. As part of the process, I talked to a number of writers, scientists, historians, and philosophers. Having secured their cooperation, I was very embarrassed to find that a large proportion of what went on ended up on the cutting room floor, simply because the series would have lasted 24 hours otherwise. Well, as it happens, the BBC agreed with me that the conversations were too interesting to be junked. And with these six supplementary programmes, they've made the extremely unusual decision to go back to the original material and to broadcast at length some of the conversations which I had. Conversations with people such as the English biologist Richard Dawkins, the American philosopher Daniel Dennett, the Cambridge theologian Dennis Turner, the American playwright Arthur Miller, the English philosopher Colin McGinn, and the American Nobel Prize winning physicist Steven Weinberg. Now, the English biologist Richard Dawkins is probably almost as well known as an atheist as he is as a scientist. And it's clear in the conversation we had that the theory of evolution played a very important part in undermining his own religious belief. But as it happens, we met right at the start of the war in Iraq. So before we could get to Darwin, we started by contemplating the role that religion had played in the policies of a Christian British Prime Minister and a Christian American President. Blair is obviously an order of magnitude more sophisticated intellectually than Bush. That would mm -hmm. be difficult. Mm. Uh, but I suspect that whereas Bush is just plain naive, um, they probably both have some sort of an idea that there's a war going on between good and evil and that, uh, I mean, in, in Bush's case, and in the case of, I think, many Americans, I suspect that many of them can't tell the difference between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. I mean, that they're all evil. And so that's why it was so easy to switch the American public from a genuine fight against terrorism after September the 11th to a totally irrelevant fight against I Iraq, which, after all, could have happened at any time. Mm. But what happened was that September the 11th focused everybody's attention on evil and the fact that there's a them against us. And uh, it, it then became very easy to muddle up in people's minds anybody evil. Now, in, in identifying them as exponents of evil, uh, I believe, and I, I'm sure you do, that uh, they actually think that evil is a principle of some sort yeah, which exists spirit, in the yeah. universe, a spirit. Mm, yeah. um, now, do you think that that notion of evil as, um, as an autonomous principle uh, is inseparably associated with a religious belief in a deity? Uh, well, I, I think it's very similar, and I, I think that there is a sort of impulse in humans to personify, and to, instead of just recognising that, that evil and good are descriptions we give to things that people do, I mean, good mm. things and bad things. I think there is a tendency to personify and to think there's a spirit of good, a spirit of evil, that implies some kind of a war between them. You can kill evil by, by having a war against, in this case, evil people, without realising that that may very well spawn a whole lot of more people who may not necessarily be evil, but who will simply rise up and do things like terrorist acts as a consequence. So, in other words, um, in addition to these mortal exponents of, uh, of wicked deeds, uh, there is, as it were, behind the visible and palpable surface, some sort of metaphysical principle which outlasts... I, I think that's what they think. Whether, whether directly... I, I expect Bush actually thinks that literally, and I think... Blair kind of subconsciously thinks it, yes. So you think that this is being an inevitable consequence of a larger religious belief in the existence of metaphysical principles in so. the universe? Uh, I, I'm sure it goes with a larger religious belief, whether, it's, whether it stems directly from that religious belief or whether both of them stem from the same kind of mental predisposition, which I dare say all humans have to some extent. I don't know. But if, as Richard suggests, all human beings share a predisposition to believe, I wanted to know the extent to which he himself might have 
experienced belief in his early life. After all, I've been talking to many people who, with varying degrees of enthusiasm, identified themselves as atheists or disbelievers, and I was interested in how people arrived at it, or whether they had had it from the start. I asked Richard whether he started life, as indeed I had, without a religious thought. No, I, I had a normal Anglican upbringing, and I think I first started to doubt it when I woke up to the fact that there were lots of different religions and they couldn't all be right, and, there, and it was just an accident, an arbitrary accident, that I happened to have been brought up in the Anglican Church. So that caused me to have doubts, and I sort of became a non-believer at the age of about nine as a result of that. However, I then reverted to religious belief uh, until the age of about 16. Okay, well, if I can stop you there yes. and say, I'm, I'm very interested in these critical moments. Yes. Um, what do you think prompted the reversion to something which you had begun to be doubtful about? I think it was the argument from design. I think, I've, I, think I started to appreciate the glorious complexity, especially of life, and didn't at that time understand the Darwinian explanation for it. And so I think that I did the, the rather naive thing of assuming that if something looks as though it's designed, it probably is designed and uh, didn't kind of wake up to the alternative explanation until I was about 16. Also didn't wake up to the fact that even without the Darwinian explanation, design is a very bad explanation for the complexity of life because it, it, it's got a regression built into it. I mean, you have to explain the designer, and so, um, so it's, it's not even a good explanation. But, but finally, I, had to, I was about 16 when I discovered Darwinism, and it was taught Darwinism, and then re realised that there, there is a, a, not just an adequate explanation for the complexity of life, but a wonderful, um, il sort of electrifyingly simple explanation, which is the Darwinian evolution. Now, did it come as a flash of delight, or was there, in fact, a, uh, an agonising sense of regret and remorse at what you had lost? I don't remember any regret. I think it was delight, and it was... A delighted sense of freedom, perhaps, from a, a view of the world which was always rather unsatisfactory anyway. And it was also delight at the positive feeling that one now had a, a, a fully satisfactory explanation of the way the world was, and that, that I had my life before me to try to understand that in detail. All right, now if I can go back to that period between 9 and 15, Nine, when you first started to have doubts about it because there were so many religions, and 15, when you had the, as it were, the biological road to Damascus and began <laughs> to read Darwin. Um, what form did your relatively undoubting religion take? I mean, in the way of observance, in the way of prayer, uh, in, in yeah. one way or another? Oh, yes. In, between 9 and 15, I was uh, pretty devout. I used to... I mean, I got confirmed. Uh, I used to pray, uh, I used to um, sort of have little fantasies at school, in boarding school, sort of creeping down to the chapel and praying and having sort of visions of angels and, and things. I, and I, I remember being prepared for confirmation, which actually, even at the time, I could sort of see that was a load of rubbish. I mean, it, I, I, I sort of forced myself to go on believing in it because here was this vicar in his cassette telling me about it. but. It, just didn't hang together. It didn't make any sense. I, I, I could follow an argument that, that said the, the world is such a beautiful place, it needs a designer. But that wasn't what it was about at all. It was all about original sin and, and things like that, which, which even then I could sort of see wasn't really coherent. So in a sense then it was more uh, tied to morality and the sense of sinfulness than it was to the beauty of the creation. I, I think the preparation for confirmation probably was, yes. I mean, were you constantly told by uh, the minister that you were, in the nature of man, um, an inheritor of some sin? I, I, don't, I don't remember that. I mean, I, I do remember odd little s stupidities, such as disease is a result of sin. And disease is not a result of bacteria or mm. viruses or cancerous tumours. Disease is, is a result of sin. And I can remember being told that and... and Hearing other people saying it later, later on, uh, uh, apparently taking it seriously, I mean, they just didn't sort of seem to, to, to realise what an extraordinarily unpleasant as well as illogical thing it is to believe. So when 
at the age of 16 you uh, became acquainted with Darwin. Was it because you were taught about Darwin or you began reading The Origin of Species? No, it was because I was taught. And were you taught by people who, as it were, were aware or seemed to be aware of the fact that it would have a, a theological consequences? No, I don't think so. I mean, it, that, that wasn't the, the terms in which they put it anyway. How soon in the lessons did you begin to see that it did have theological consequences, that it more or less knocked the idea of design on the head? I do remember that I understood the principle of Darwinism before I believed it was really big enough to do the job. So I understood the principle of it and realised that, yes, that is a candidate explanation for doing this job, but I still don't think it's a big enough job. And it was only later that I decided, yes, it is a big enough. Well, in that case, I'm, go I'm going to ask you this question. I'm going to ask you, for, for the point of view of the viewers, to... Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awkward way, a question I'm asking you, to give us a, a summary of the most persuasive version oh, fine, okay. of Darwinian theory. Right. First, I would make a distinction between the, the fact of evolution, the actual change from generation to generation that has led from bacterial ancestors to all the creatures that we have today by gradual, gradual change, such that you wouldn't have noticed it hmm. um, in, in any particular generation. That is a matter of fact which can be observed not directly but by its aftermath in the form of fossils and the pattern of living creatures. Then ask, what is the guiding force that led to it being like that? Natural selection. And the, the most illuminating way I can think of to explain that is that all living things contain digitally coded representations of themselves, digitally coded instructions for building themselves and for making more like themselves. The instructions survive or they don't survive depending upon how good the bodies are at surviving and how good the bodies are at reproducing and therefore passing them on. Mm -hmm. Therefore the world becomes filled with coded instructions for being successful in building bodies that survive and reproduce those very same coded instructions. Mm. Now, the objection that is constantly raised by people who hear this, to me and to you, extremely persuasive argument, they say, aha, but what is the source of these fruitful novelties upon which natural selection exerts its pressures? People would say, well, surely the novelties themselves, even if uh, they are then, uh, uh, pressure is exerted upon them, something has to explain the novelties themselves. Yeah. Well, the novelties themselves, of course, are genetic variations in the gene pool, which ultimately come from mutation and more proximally come from sexual recombination. There's nothing very inventive or ingenious about those novelties. I mean, they are random. Mm. And uh, they mostly are um, deleterious. Most, most mutations are bad. And so you really need to focus on natural selection as the, as the positive side, and it's only natural selection that produces uh, living things which have the, the illusion of design. The, the illusion of design does not come from the novelty. It comes from, from what happens to the novelty as it is filtered through. But the argument was constantly levelled about the, um, the imperceptible changes which might, in fact, as they were developed and recurred would have culminated in something as useful as a feather. Um, they, right. they constantly emphasised the fact, what was it about that early novelty, before it had accumulated to the point where it was recognisably doing an, an adaptive job, where could natural selection get its purchase upon yes. something which was uh, no more than a pimple? Yes. Uh, well, the, it, it's a fair point, and it, it's one that I've talked about quite a lot. Um, there, we, there cannot have been intermediate stages which were not beneficial. It's, there's, there's no room in natural selection for the sort of... Um, foresight argument that says, well, if we go to persist for the next million years and it'll start becoming useful, uh, that doesn't work. There's got to be a selection pressure all the way. So there isn't a process, as it were, going on in the cells saying, look, be patient. No. It, it's going to be a feather, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> <laughs> yes.
<laughs> Sidney Brenner satirized, satirized that beautifully when he said he imagined a, some protein arising, uh, ar arising in the Cambrian, which was kept because it might come in handy in the Cretaceous. <laughs> um, it, it's, it, do, it doesn't happen like that. Uh, there's got to be a series of advantages all the way in, in the feather. If you can't think of one, then that's your problem, not uh, not natural selection's problem. Natural selection, um, uh, well, I suppose that is a sort of matter of faith on my on my mm. part, since the theory is so coherent and so and so powerful. You mentioned feathers. I mean, it's perfectly possible that feathers began as sort of fluffy um, extensions of reptilian scales to act as um, uh, heat um, insulators. And so the, the final perfection of the sort of wing feathers that we see in flying birds might have come very much later. And the earliest feathers might have been um, a, a different approach to hairiness among reptiles keeping them warm. Over and over again, we come across um, cases where an, an organ starts out doing one thing and then gets modified to do, doing another thing. Uh, but... Um, it's, it's not very useful to challenge an individual biologist's ingenuity mm. in thinking up what particular intermediates might have looked like because we don't, I mean, maybe we're just not ingenious enough to think what they are. I should have thought um, there's a more general argument, which is that we... We shouldn't in any case be saying, oh, I can't think what the explanation for it is, therefore it must have been designed. Yeah. There's a fatal weakness in any argument which says, I cannot understand how X could have happened, therefore it must have been designed. It would be as if you took a, a famous scientific discovery, and I think of Hodgkin and Huxley's working out of the how the nerve impulse works, a very difficult problem involving very tough mathematics. Suppose that they found it too difficult. W would we have respected them if they'd said something like, I can't work out how this nerve impulse works, Hodgkin. Can you? No, Huxley, I can't. Let's just give up and say, it, and say, and say God did it. It's that element of giving up. It's that element of defeatism, saying, I can't understand how it works, therefore let's fall back on the design explanation. Yes, and, even if it doesn't take the form of explicit... Um, uh, conscious design on the part of a creator. The one of the one one of the ideas which seems to me to be the counterpart of what you're saying was the inv the invoking of the vital principle oh, yeah, in the absolutely. 19th century. But, I mean, vi vital principles, force locomotive. And, and they, none of them explain anything. They're just redescriptions of the of the problem. But they're pernicious because people think they explain something. It sort of vaguely sounds as though it explains something, and people are so used to the idea that complicated things in our human world are indeed designed and made. But when you've said, oh, it was designed by God, you've explained absolutely nothing because you're left with the problem of explaining where, where the designer came from. And so it's, it's, it's a non-explanation. We, we shouldn't even regard it as a candidate explanation. Why do you think it was that for really very intelligent biologists to invoke something which we can see now, and it's surprising that they couldn't see then, was such a vacuous explanation as the vital principle to account for the spontaneity of living things. Well, I suppose it's all very well for us to say um, we can see that it's nonsense, but when you didn't have anything better... Um, I mean, I, I could imagine, in the time of Hume, for example, um, he, he would have said, this is a bad explanation, and he was right but he didn't actually have a better one to put in its place. And so you have to be quite intellectually courageous to stick on the, um, the, the philosophical point that is clearly a bad explanation. And I think that the, in a real sense it had to wait for Darwin, who produced a deeply satisfying explanation. I mean, it would have been wonderful if... I mean, to, if Hume would have been simply captivated to have heard Darwin's explanation, I, su I suspect. For Richard, then, the theory of evolution provided support for his growing disbelief. But I wanted to know why atheism was such a pressing issue for him. Why is this argument so important 
at this point in the 21st century, one... You and I can see that it's a settled issue, and yet we find ourselves in, 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 in an embattled position. And why is the argument well, so important? As a scientist, to me it's important because I do regard the hypothesis of a supernatural designer as a scientific hypothesis. I think it's a wrong one, but it, it actually is science. One can't... I, I don't have much patience with theologians who say, well, we're really not disagreeing, it's just that religion concerns itself with morality and science concerns itself with the way the universe is and there's no problem between them. To me, there is a problem because the moment you talk about a supernatural creator, designer, anything, you are advancing a scientific hypothesis, which is either right or wrong. I mean, it, 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 a universe that has a supernatural intelligence, a supernatural overmind in it, is a very, very different kind of universe from a purely scientific point of view mm. than a u universe which hasn't. And it's a, it's a very, very interesting difference. I mean, it's a massive difference. And I think it's scientifically interesting to hold a view of the universe which I do, which is that there is no supermind. Well, there may be minds far superior to ours, but they will also have come into, the, into existence through a slow, gradual, incremental process. They were not there from the start. People who hold the opposite view, that there was a supernatural intelligence right from the start, responsible for it all, are advancing a very, very diametrically different scientific hypothesis, which has got mm. to be either right or wrong. Even if we can't finally decide whether it's right or wrong, we must at least admit that it is a, a, a different hypothesis, very different hypothesis, and therefore it matters. But I often encounter religious people who argue in the following way. They'll say, well, it's not really, and we don't think of it as a scientific hypothesis. We think of it as something which involves a leap of faith. In other words, that it's not something which they say can be proved right or wrong. There's no way in which it can be proved right or wrong because it belongs to a domain of existence and entities about which that sort of proof, disproof and research are irrelevant. There is something which they call the leap of faith which identifies you with this creator. Well, that sort of thing just leaves me cold. I mean, I, I can't really even begin to empathise with it. I, I understand that it may be in principle impossible to demonstrate one way or the other, so there, there may be no scientific test you could ever do to decide the question, and that I could believe. But to me, that still leaves, leaves the point that it either is true or it isn't. A leap of faith which just means that a person has a, a sort of inside, internal feeling of revelation which is not shareable with anybody else and which can't be demonstrated to anybody else, to me that just sounds like a mental delusion. Why is it then that people actually invoke the notion of a leap of faith, not as a weakness on their part, but as some sort of virtue which is lacking in people like you and me, well, it, that there yes. is some sort of uh, peculiar willingness, and a willingness which indicates some sort of spiritual generosity, which we yes. somehow don't have. Well, I mean, first thing, I think it's important to stress in view of our earlier conversation that the kind of person you're now talking about is a very much more sophisticated animal than the sort who argues about... Um, uh, creationism and, mm. and that, that kind of thing, because those people really would think that there was some intervention by the deity in the world. But your, your people with, the in, with their internal revelation presumably uh, accept that their god doesn't actually intervene in the world, otherwise they would have to concede that it is a scientific hypothesis. Mm. So the domain in which he, he works, or it works, seems to be a... A, a rather strangely detached from the world domain, purely concerned with internal feelings that people privately have. But the implication is that it's a domain from which we are unfortunate enough to be excluded. That's right. And, and as and I say, that uh, it's, yes, a, I mean, it's a lack of some sort of uh, talent, generosity, 
or uh, blindness yes. on our part, which cuts us off from the beauty and ma majesty yeah. of this domain. Like not knowing what it's like to fall in love or, or something. Yes. Like being, being, being deprived, being deficient in some important way. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I, I can understand that. And, and I uh, actually could, could imagine that, that we're not so deprived as... I mean, because you, you and I probably do have feelings that, are, that may very well be akin to a kind of mystical um, wonder at when we contemplate the stars, when we contemplate the galaxies, when we contemplate life, the, the sheer expanse of geological time. I, I experience, and I expect you experience, internal feelings which sound pretty much like um, what mystics feel, and they call it God. Uh, if and, and I've been called a very religious person for that, for that reason. If I am called a religious person, then I, my retort to that is, well, you're playing with words. Because what the vast majority of people mean by religious is something utterly different from this sort of transcendent, mystical experience. What they mean is a, an, a, an entity which interferes in the world, which actually has some kind of impact upon the world and therefore is a scientific hypothesis. The... The transcendent sense, the transcendent mystic sense that, that people who are both religious and non-religious, in my usage of the, of the term, is something very, very different. In that sense, I probably am a religious person. You probably are mm. a religious person. But that doesn't mean we think that there is an, a supernatural being that interferes with the world, that does anything, that, that manipulates anything, or, by the way, that, will, that, that it's worth praying to or asking forgiveness of sins from, etc. But once we concede that, I, I know this is what I call the clergyman in the, um, in the laurel bushes, that as soon as one makes any concession in the direction of wonder or, or um, a sense of majesty and mystery, and it's not confined to the large things, I mean, just simply contemplating uh, mitochondria yes. or produces the same mm. sort of mm. Blakean feelings yes. that yes, he exactly. had from grains of sand. Exactly. They, the clergyman in the, uh, uh, in the laurel bushes leaps out and says, ah, yes. you are one of us after exactly. all. Exactly, it's happened to me over and over again. I think it's deeply dishonest, I and mean, I, think, I think it's fooling around with words and not understanding or not, not, not honestly dealing with the way ordinary people use words. And so um, I, I prefer to use words like religion, like God, in the way that the vast majority of people in the world would understand them and to reserve a different kind of language for the feeling that we share with possibly your clergyman in the, in the, in the laurel. But, uh, I mean, as soon as one does admit that and admits the unknowability of things, uh, there is always the implication from the religious, not necessarily from the orthodox religious, but the, the, uh, uh, the people who are susceptible to energies and vibrations and aromas and so forth, <laughs> um, to uh, the idea that well, they often say, there must be something. Well, OK, I and mean, it just doesn't follow. It's just... It's just um... Well, my answer to them when they say there must be something, and I always say, well, yes, there is. It's everything. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, it's, it's there without yes. any super-added... Yes. I mean, I think I would, I would hit back harder than that, actually, and say, and say that, the, that, the, that the, the sense of wonder that one gets as a scientist contemplating the cosmos or contemplating mitochondria is actually much grander than anything that you will get by um, contemplating the traditional objects of religious mysticism. Mm -hmm.